Welcome to the Federal Society's Practice Group Podcast. The following podcast, hosted by the Federal Society's Administrative Law and Regulation Practice Group, was recorded on Monday, April 10th, 2017, during a live teleform conference call held exclusively for Federal Society members. Welcome to the Practice Group's teleform conference call as today we discuss the administrative state. I'm Dean Reuter, Vice President, General Counsel, and Director of Practice Groups here at the Federal Society. Please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the experts on today's call. Also, this call is being recorded for use as a podcast in the future. We're very pleased to welcome three experts to our call today. They are the co-authors of Unleashing Opportunity, Policy Reforms for an Accountable Administrative State. That is available uh, online. There's a Kindle edition for 99 cents. If you spend a dollar, you'll get a penny back. Uh, the, the, the title, again, is Unleashing Opportunity. Policy Reforms for an Accountable Administrative State. Uh, the co-authors who are joining us here today will hear first from Adam White. He's a research fellow at the Hoover Institution and an adjunct professor at the Antonin Scalia Law School. He's going to give a, a general overview, then turn things over to uh, Co- Kevin Kozar. He's the Governance Project Director and Senior Fellow at the R Street Institute here in Washington, D.C., uh, he'll be followed by Oren Cass, a senior fellow at Manhattan Institute, and then back to Adam White uh, for his discussion of the book. Uh, let me mention the title one more time. That's, again, Unleashing Opportunity, Policy Reforms for an Accountable Administrative State. With that, Adam White, the floor is yours. Well, thanks, Dean, and thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, it's a fitting day to discuss this issue with uh, Justice Gorsuch having been sworn in this morning to the Supreme Court. Uh, his hearings were, as usual, Supreme Court hearing, nomination hearings covered a, a lot of issues, but what was particular, particularly interesting about Gorsuch's hearing was the amount of focus on the administrative state and Gorsuch's opinions uh, raising some skeptical questions about current doctrines regarding judicial deference and, and other aspects of the administrative state. Um, as Gorsuch's nomination illustrated, there's a number of judges on the Supreme Court and lower courts rethinking some basic principles about how we govern ourselves. At the same time, we've seen in the White House uh, a number of executive orders right away uh, trying to reframe the relationship between the White House and the agencies and also imposing new duties and, and standards upon many of the agencies. And meanwhile, in Congress, we've seen a number of bills for more comprehensive reform, legislation like the RAINS Act, the Regulatory Accountability Act, the Separation of Powers Restoration Act, and other statutes intended to legislate a new relationship between the agencies and the three branches of government. Uh, that's, in, in a way, what we've tried to achieve in this new report. It's a report out from National Affairs, the, the quarterly journal on public policy. Our report's the second in a three-book series on unleashing opportunity, the first being on technology and innovation, the third will be on higher education. As Dean said, we focused on policy reforms for an accountable administrative state. And by that, we mean uh, looking at the administrative state from all three branches of government, uh, the first branch, Congress, and then the executive branch, and then the judicial branch, for ways to make the administrative state more accountable, uh, more limited, and more responsive to judicial review. And so uh, each of us, one at a time, will quickly go through our chapters, just offering our basic diagnosis of the issue and some policy reforms, and then and then uh, we'll open it up to questions. So please, with that, Kevin, uh, on to the first branch. Thank you, Adam. Well, um, glad to be here on the on the call uh, with Federalist Society members, and I'm talking about Congress and its role in regulation, which is, I think, a little bit unusual in the conversations that we tend to have around regulation. Um, I think they tend to focus more heavily on the executive branch, since they're the one generating them and executing them, and also, obviously, on the judiciary, because that's where so many regulations, particularly the big ones, end up being decided. But I think there's real importance in speaking about the legislature, Um, not least because we have this thing uh, that's often forgotten in this town known as a constitution. And the constitution very clearly contemplated uh, that Congress was to be the font of all law. Article 1, Section 1 is very clear. All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in the Congress of the United States. And interestingly, 
Article 1 later adds that Congress shall have the power to make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces. So both the domestic executive branch sphere and in the realm of uh, war with other nations, Congress clearly has a rulemaking, regulatory making uh, role to play. I recently um, had the pleasure of reading a book called The First Congress, uh, How James Madison, George Washington, and a Group of Extraordinary Men Invented the Government is the title, and it's by Fergus M. Bordwich. And he depicts how the First Congress kind of got the government up and running and the attitudes they had, and it was abundantly clear from the words uttered during the First Congress that the executive branch was to be largely the servant of the legislature. That obviously is not what we have today. Um, today the executive branch is this behemoth. It's a $4 trillion a year operation with 160 or maybe even 180 agencies within it, 4 million employees, and untold millions uh, toiling for it as a contractor. That is in sharp contrast to our legislature, which is rather puny, to be honest. Uh, it's got a budget of a mere $4.5 billion, which is essentially a rounding error if you look at our federal budget. And it's not particularly well-staffed as a branch. Uh, the number of employees working for Congress over the last 40 years has actually declined despite the fact that government has gotten bigger and bigger and spending has grown and grown and policy complexity has increased. Um, we've seen in our constitutional system, from my, my take, a ebbing away of legislative power, a sliding into a kind of disbalance because lawmaking, the central power of the legislature, has flowed to the executive. Uh, to be clear, Congress in many instances has delegated this power away, but in other instances, you know, this is just what happens when you stand up agencies um, and allow them to make rules and do not, as a legislature, play any sort of role in that process. Um, I tallied not too long ago uh, that Congress enacts maybe 50 significant laws each year, and as we all know, executive agencies issue about 4,000 new rules per year, 80 to 100 of which have an economic effects of 100 million or more, and that doesn't even include all the guidance documents that come out. So, yes, we've seen a huge amount of lawmaking power in the form of regulation um, go to the executive branch um, at the cost uh, to the legislature. Now, when I was writing this chapter, one thing I found which um, was really stunning to me was an insight from James Madison, who in his time, the government was tiny, yet he understood what big government could do to legislative control. He wrote that, Quote, the extension of the federal powers to every subject falling within the idea of the general welfare would have ill effects. Particularly, one consequence must be to enlarge the sphere of discretion allotted to the magistrate. End quote. This is just kind of a basic math issue. Um, the more agencies you have, the more... Uh, members of Congress have to pay attention to for oversight purposes, and the less time that they have to pay attention to any one particular thing. And when that number of agencies goes up and up and up and up and up, pretty soon you end up with a Congress that has only a fleeting knowledge, for the most part, with what's going on in the executive branch. And that's clearly not what the founders contemplated, and it creates, I think, serious legitimacy issues. And this circles back to the, the subject of this tome, how can we make the administrative state more accountable? And one basic way to do that is to 
make its actions more tethered to the legislative branch because the legislative branch is the branch that is most closely tethered to the public and the diverse interest groups out there. And so I have argued for a reassertion of congressional authority in regulatory policy. And I'm pleased that there are folks on the Hill, uh, Mike Lee, Ben Sass, uh, there's a whole host of folks who are taking seriously the problem of the regulatory state. Um, but we need more people on the Capitol Hill to pay attention, and we need solutions um, that structurally um, aim to rebalance our constitutional system a bit. I'm not naive. I don't suppose that Congress can take over and regulate everything, um, but there's got to be a happy middle ground between essentially regulating everything as a legislature and letting the executive branch do whatever it wants. Uh, so in my chapter, I lay out um, a number of ideas. I'll just touch upon a few very quickly. Uh, first, I think it would be very valuable if Congress created a BRAC-like commission to examine the current corpus of regulations, which is about 180,000 pages in the Code of Federal Regulations, and to weed out the failed and anachronistic ones. Just put together a bipartisan commission to go through to select these things, take comments from the public, industry, attorneys, etc., identify these things as best one can, ball them up together, and have an up or down vote on them. Just reducing that load in and of itself, that regulatory load, I think, uh, would restore some accountability. Second, uh, I've spoken in favor of something along the lines of the RAINS Act, which, I mean, the House has already passed it four times. I'm not sure the Senate quite has the appetite or the votes to do it. But I think on the really, really big regulations, like net neutrality, I think Congress has to vote on it. You can't just have it handed down from unelected um, executive branch officials. I mean, net neutrality ones were particularly astonishing because I think they were enacted on a three to two or four to three basis. Um, that's a very small number of people who were deciding something that was quite huge. And unsurprisingly, it, got, it ended up in the courts. Last, I do think that a regulatory budget would be valuable. Um, many foreign countries have regulatory budgets, and I was impressed that Trump uh, got out of the box and said we should have one. I would, however, realizing that executive orders can be swept away by incoming presidents, I would prefer some sort of congressional statutory action to solidify the regulatory budget so it doesn't go away in case we have a change in presidency in a couple of years. And the final uh, idea I'll put out there for how to strengthen Congress's hands in regulation is an idea that we put forth, I and Philip Wallach and Brookings put forth in National Affairs Journal last autumn, and that's creating a congressional regulation office modeled on the Congressional Budget Office. In short, Regulations are extremely complex. Uh, they come out every week. And there is no way Congress currently has the ability to intellectually, technically, scientifically engage with these things. Congress really right now is at the utter mercy of the executive branch. There's vast, vast information asymmetry. And so if we want Congress to get involved in regulation and to make the administrative state more accountable, it's going to need brain power, nonpartisan brain power. And so uh, with that, let me um, just say in closing that clearly the Constitution gives Congress all the authority it needs to fund and staff itself so that it can assert itself in regulation. Right now on the Hill, I'm seeing shoots of green as Congress is using the Congressional Review Act and it is trying to move regulatory reform bills. These are positive developments, I hope, I hope Congress will take it further. And uh, with that, let me turn it over to Orrin Cass. All right. Thank you, Kevin. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining the call. I focused on uh, the executive branch. And, you know, on the one hand, it, it's a bit oxymoronic, I suppose, to say we, we need the executive branch to be more accountable to itself. Uh, but I, I think there's actually a very serious problem right now within the executive branch, which is that the administrative state – 
uh, through the agencies in the White House really function quite independent of each other. Uh, and that's a problem because on the one hand, the rationale for having an administrative state is that it's technocratic, it's well run, um, it's going to do things that a deliberative body couldn't do effectively. Uh, and yet on the other hand, we've set it up to run, frankly, as poorly as possible with, among other things, absolutely nobody in charge. Uh, and I think the other branches have actually done this somewhat on purpose. You know, Congress delegates more and more into the executive branch. The courts defer more and more to the executive branch. Uh, but they do so on an assumption that things are going to be so disorganized that, that no one within the executive branch could actually consolidate that power. And so it, it arrives at this odd equilibrium that says all of the power is in the executive, but it's, it's divided against itself while it's there. Uh, and among other things, that means we don't really get the value of a well-functioning administrative state. Uh, you know, one thing I think is important to keep in mind when we talk about an accountable administrative state, it's likely to regulate less than it does today, but we should be just as concerned about it regulating well, even if in some cases that means it regulates more. Um, and so what I focused on was the idea that we actually need the White House to assert directive control over the agency rulemaking processes. Um, OIRA, ever since it emerged in the 1980s, has kind of lived in a legal gray zone. It's always providing oversight or review or consultation. Uh, no one has ever really asserted or tested the directive authority, either that OIRA has over the agencies or that the president would have in other contexts. Um, but you know, that creates real problems. It prevents the White House from setting the policy agenda as efficiently and directly as it should. It prevents the White House from directing analysis. Uh, and it creates what's called OIRA avoidance, where it actually creates bad incentives in the agencies to do things to try to play the OIRA game that OIRA is playing because it doesn't think it's actually in charge. Um, you know, I think one obvious example of that is cost-benefit analysis where at this point the EPA alone has more than twice as many environmental economists as OIRA has total staff. Um, so in theory, cost-benefit analysis is supposed to keep excessive regulation in check. Uh, in practice, it has become a tool for selling additional regulation to a body that is supposed to be uh, overseeing it. And the other problem, I think, is that the equilibrium at the end of the day is not all that stable. We saw in the Obama administration, we're seeing in the Trump administration, uh, that the president will attempt to consolidate power. And if it's all done uh, kind of behind the scenes through uh, memos and guidance, and it's, uh, it's, it's not good for the rule of law. And so the core of my proposal is for the, the president to assert directive authority over agency rulemaking. Uh, that would start with an executive order that says the president has to sign anything that's going to go into the federal register. Um, I, I can hear the lawyers on the phone worrying that that may or may not be constitutional. Um, I actually think it's a little bit strange that we worry about whether or not the president has directive authority over the agencies, um, because the reality is that he already has, we know, all of the powers that anybody in, in a private sector context has. In, in other words, if you think about the CEO of an organization, uh, no one wonders whether the CEO has directive authority over uh, the other people in the company, he, he doesn't, he, he can't force them to do things. He can't, if he gets a bad marketing plan, he can't send a memo uh, ordering, a, you know, th th there's no legally justiciable demand for a better marketing plan. He can remove the marketing director. He can uh, reorganize the marketing department and he can move the budget around. Um, obviously, the president already has that authority with respect to the agencies. And so for all intents and purposes, that does mean that he has the directive authority. Once he's asserted that authority, a lot flows from it. I think the most important is that OIRA can then function as the active controller of rulemaking throughout the government, not as a reactive reviewer. Um, so an appropriately staffed OIRA could manage and set the, uh, the rulemaking timelines across agencies. Uh, a, a well-staffed OIRA could run the federal regulatory budget that, that Kevin was talking about and, uh, you know, could actually do it well, could actually figure out what regulations cost and, and be the arbiter of that rather than the, the self-interested agency being the arbiter. 
And then also really importantly, I think OIRA could take a much firmer role in dictating the way that regulations are evaluated. Um, you know, EPA right now spends hundreds of millions of dollars a year on research grants. Uh, the, the top topic that they fund is research on how to measure the benefits of their rules. And uh, that we shouldn't be spending zero on that. We, we do need to understand how to measure the benefits of environmental rules. But if more of the control was in OIRA, you would expect uh, both because it's more disinterested and because it's more politically accountable uh, to see a lot more of the focus on things like the cost of the rules. Uh, and just as we have a value of a statistical life that uh, produces very high benefits for uh, many environmental rules, you would, ex you would want to have similar metrics that uh, translate direct regulatory costs into, uh, into economic costs, into job losses, into, slow, into reductions in productivity growth. The thing that comes to my mind first when I think about why this might not make sense is a concern that it sounds like we're swallowing the agencies whole, that we're basically saying OIRA is now the one super agency to rule them all. And the reality is that that's not true at all. Most of what agencies do from information gathering, monitoring, permitting, day-to-day -day operations, enforcement, adjudication, that's the actual work of the executive branch that agencies were constituted for long before they were asked to be substitute legislators. And so under this model, that would all remain uh, their day-to-day -day work, and it would be the, uh, the delegated legislating that would, would move toward the White House and more political accountability. And the last thing I'll just say is to emphasize that, you know, the net effect of this should not be an aggrandizement of the presidency. Um, you know, the reforms in the other branches that Kevin just talked about, that Adam will talk about now, are important for accounting for uh, and cabining what would be a more energized office. Uh, I think it's likely that the president needs to be the first mover and, and can help force people's hands. I think if the president did this, Congress would be a lot more interested very quickly in some of the things Kevin was talking about. Um, but at the end of the day, the goal should be an executive branch that has a narrowed scope of authority, uh, but greater capacity to use the authority that it is granted. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Adam. Thanks, Oren. Um, so my chapter was focused on judicial review. Um, and in thinking about how judicial review and the agency process might be improved, I think it's one useful place to start is some of the more controversial rulemakings of the last few years. Um, the last administration promulgated rules uh, like the Clean Power Plan, the Waters of the United States rule, uh, its FCC put out the Open Internet Order, the net neutrality program that reflected the, the, uh, the president's uh, policy priorities. What ties these three examples together is not just that they're massive rulemakings, extremely consequential and extremely controversial. At a more mundane level, what ties them together is they're all examples of what we lawyers call informal rulemaking or notice and comment rulemaking. Uh, it's the simplest of ways by which an agency can promulgate new regulations. They just issue their proposed rule. They accept public comments. Uh, they, by and large, ignore most of the comments. I mean, they, they offer perfunctory responses to them, but they don't really change the rules significantly or fundamentally in response to comments since they've already gone through the trouble of, of teeing the rule up with a proposal. So the, the, the process too often resembles basically a, a kabuki dance, just a, just a process for the sake of, of, uh, of, of of checking a number of procedural boxes, but without any real public substantive input on the process. Agencies do this because they, they're allowed to do this under the Administrative Procedure Act, or more specifically, the Administrative Procedure Act of 1946. I think it's good to remind people of the year that it was passed because it's been 70 years since this basic body of law has been significantly updated. And in those 70 years, we've seen administrative law bear less and less resemblance to administrative reality. The Act of 46 uh, resembled the administrative state as it existed at the end of World War II, but we really can't say the same for administrative law today and its relationship to the agencies that it purports to govern. Agencies do uh, everything, as far as rulemaking goes, agencies go almost exclusively through notice and comment rulemaking instead of the, the more formal rulemaking procedures that the APA provided for. 
increasingly in recent years, agencies have evaded even these minimal procedural requirements by making law effectively through guidance documents, like the Dear Colleague letters that the Education Department put out, or any number of of, uh, of, of minimalist uh, instructives uh, published on, say, frequently asked questions parts of, of websites, on the agency's websites. At the same time as the agencies are, are doing less and less process, uh, judicial review of what comes out of the agencies is, is, is ever more minimal. We saw this a lot again through the Gorsuch hearings and its discussion of judicial deference. Uh, but through deference and, and other judicial doctrines of the last few decades, the courts have allowed agencies more and more to, to effectively grade their own homework. Uh, there are a couple other technical issues that I, I spot in, uh, in, in, in my chapter in this book. For example, the problem of stays pending appeal. Agencies can issue extremely impactful rulemakings and then begin to enforce them immediately, even when judicial review hasn't begun or, or completed, uh, which allows the agencies in some cases to secure full compliance with the rules before the courts finally sign off. There was a controversial example a couple of years ago where the EPA lost a very significant Supreme Court case, and then the next day the EPA effectively spiked the football, declaring that even though they'd lost the case, they'd forced the entire industry into compliance, making judicial review a moot point. And at the same time, agencies and, and their ideological supporters on the outside are able to lock in the agenda through sue and settle lawsuits that, that effectively bind the agency going forward through judicial court uh, consent decrees. Now, like I said, in 1946, the administrative state looked much different, and the 46 Act was a compromise by Republicans and Democrats after decades of debate and investigation to try to map meaningful law meaningful procedural requirements onto the agencies as they existed in 46. And so in, in my chapter in this book, I urge Congress to try to do the same thing here. Congress should reform the APA in the same spirit that the APA was originally passed to improve public accountability and judicial oversight. And so let me just quickly run through a few of the proposals in my chapter. First, I urge Congress to, to increase impose heightened rulemaking requirements, to reimpose the requirements of formal rulemaking on more uh, regulations coming out of the agencies. This uh, is reflected in the current Regulatory Accountability Act, which would take the costliest of rules, the most burdensome of rules, and subject them to more process, force the agencies to have in-person hearings where experts could actually be questioned, cross-examined, and challenged, uh, and put more substantive standards on the agencies as well to make sure that the costliest and most burdensome of rules, like, like net neutrality or the Clean Power Plan, actually go through a rigorous process and not just the minimalist standards of informal rulemaking. Now, whenever formal rulemaking is proposed, uh, the common response is that the proposal would be self-defeating, that as soon as you put more procedural requirements on agencies, they'll just evade those procedural requirements. And so my second recommendation is tied to that. Uh, there's been a debate over whether to get rid of Chevron deference. It's sort of an all-or-nothing debate. Chevron supporters want to keep it. Its critics want to get rid of it altogether. Uh, in our book, I, I propose sort of a middle way. Uh, to keep Chevron deference for the regulations that actually come out of the rulemaking process, including the new standards I propose, but then get rid of Chevron deference for everything else, for agency adjudications, for guidance documents, and so on, to get rid of any judicial deference to those uh, agency actions and effectively give agencies a choice up front, either go through a rigorous procedure at the front end and then get some deference at the back end, or to just take the easy way uh, from the beginning and then know that they're going to be subjected to stricter, more rigorous judicial review at the back end of the process. Uh, a few other proposals in the book uh, propose reforming uh, the stays or injunctions pending judicial review. Instead of putting the burden on the challengers, parties challenging a regulation, to prove that it's a special case worthy of an injunction uh, to block enforcement of an, of an agency action while judicial review is pending, I propose to flip it to make uh, injunctions or stays uh, the default rule for the costliest of rules and, and put the burden on the agencies to justify uh, in special cases uh, that they be allowed to enforce the rulemaking or other agency action while judicial review is pending. And then finally, for the sue and settle problem, we propose uh, to treat those consent decrees like, uh, like class action cases. 
uh, before the courts sign off on them, uh, open the process up for public review, inspection, uh, comment, to ensure that, that sue and settle consent decrees aren't a, uh, an anti-democratic way to lock in an agency agenda without real meaningful transparency. Now, all of those proposals, as well as Oren's and Kevin's, are contained in the book the Dean mentioned at the very beginning, uh, Unleashing Opportunity, Policy Reforms for an Accountable Administrative State. And in fact, uh, the entire text of it is freely available in PDF form on National Affairs' website. That's nationalaffairs.com. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dean. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I'm very pleased to have you with us today. Uh, Let's get the audience involved. In a moment, we'll all hear an announcement that will say the floor mode is on. After you hear that announcement, if you have a question, push the star button and then the pound button on your telephone. So once again, if you have a question for any of our experts, push the star button and then the pound button on your telephone. Um, we don't have any questions yet. We have a lot of people on the lines. Our, our, our lines are wide open. Push the star button, then the pound button if you have a question. I'll start us off uh, with a question about what might be a missing chapter in the book. I know you can only ever do so much with one book, but um, do, do you address at all the role of the states in the evolution of uh, the, the, the 50 states in the evolution of the administrative uh, state and its accumulation of power? That is the idea that States, either willingly or unwillingly, over the past hundred years or so, have given up power to the federal government, and then once there, uh, it sort of slides over to the administrative state. Is there any discussion of that, or do you agree with that uh, uh, that that sort of premise? Or? Well, let me let me. This is Adam. Let me just say, Dean, that you're right. We don't de dedicate a chapter to the states, and, and the states have a very important role to play. Uh, the law professor Jillian Metzger remarked a couple of years ago in an article that the administrative agencies were becoming the central battleground for federalism since uh, modern administrative agencies were really stretching the bounds of their power and raising significant federalism questions. Now it's the problem is less that Congress is going beyond the limits of the Constitution and the Commerce Clause and now more that the administrative agencies are taking sometimes ordinary delegations of power from the Congress and stretching them to raise profound uh, constitutional issues and federalism issues. Uh, states have pushed back, of course, in litigation. Uh, the states have been uh, leading uh, lawsuits uh, challenging either agency action or, in some cases, the very uh, creation of agency power in the first instance. Um, and I know there are proposals out there uh, to to amend the Constitution to give uh, to, to return more power back to the states, but it's not something we've addressed directly in the paper. Hey, Adam, this is Oren. I was going to make one other point about that which is I think in a lot of cases, you know, the vector by which states have lost this power to the administrative state is less through uh, the, the kind of rulemaking process and, and the delegations, the way that the other branches have lost it, and more from a spending perspective. Um, that as states have become more and more reliant on federal money in their budgets for everything from infrastructure to healthcare to education, uh, they've they've basically handed you know handed a loaded gun to Washington, uh, and that that that's really the mechanism by which a lot of the uh, powers claimed in Washington, regardless of federalism principles, and you know I think reforms with how spending flows will in a lot of cases be more important than reforms with respect to the kind of legal formalities of of the administrative state if we want to insulate states more from uh, from what's going on in Washington. And, you know, as it happens, this, this is Adam again, I was having breakfast this morning with a, a friend of mine who sits on a state regulatory commission that deals with uh, energy and environmental issues. And as we talked, he remarked on how in so many of the states, the state regulators themselves see themselves less as as uh, agents of the people of their state and, and more agents of federal regulators, right? The relationship between um, between the EPA, say, and, and state air quality regulators 
in many cases, the state regulators seem to be um, less interested in what the people of their state have to say and, and more interested in what the EPA has to say and through either the trade group for these regulators or uh, in their interactions with the EPA. They seem to become more and more like branch offices of the EPA and, and not uh, sovereign regulators of, uh, for the sake of their own state. And that's a cultural issue and a political issue as much as a legal issue, and it really, I think, cries out for reform. We've got one caller with a question. If you'd like to join the queue, you need to push the star button, then the pound button on your telephone. Let's take our first call of the day. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for uh, presenting this issue. I've always thought this was one of the little grassroot issues that have driven um, to the Trump administration and their desire to limit the uh, administrative state. My question, and I came in a little late. I had to go actually do a little something to make a living. The question is, it seems to me that, and I'd ask, does your book include any limitations on the language used in the statutes to delegate? Um, one of the commentators said that they're handing loaded guns to the agencies, and that's a little bit of the way I feel about delegation, it is if Congress quit delegating on limited subjects or sunset it so that the agency loses its power and has to come back and explain what it did. Is that part of your reform? And I apologize if I missed that chapter. Oh, hi. This is Kevin Kosar responding. Thank you for the uh, question, and I think it's, it's spot on. Um, my short answer is no. In my chapter, I did not because I haven't satisfactorily to myself resolved how do you stop Congress from writing vague language? Um, frequently, the reason vague language is used is because they can't reach political agreement on the Hill, so they put the language in vaguely, and then they kick it over to the executive branch. That is something I think is probably endemic to pluralistic politics. Um, I've fantasized about some sort of uh, entity inside Congress, something more than House and Senate Council that would perhaps review uh, bills before they get sent to the President and, you know, clarity would be forced through some way, but I'm not sure how to do that. And I have to say, your idea about sunsets is something um, I like, uh, not least because sunsets would, over time, reduce the regulatory load so that we don't just have aggregation year after year after year. Uh, and it would force Congress to re-engage standing policies instead of just forgetting about them and letting the executive branch uh, handle them. So thank you. And this is Adam. I just add that delegation is it's it's such an obvious problem, and we sort of mentioned that in an introductory essay that the problem is less that the executive branch and the agencies are stripping power away from Congress, and more a problem of Congress just handing its own powers away. Um, reforming that is, is such a challenge. I mean, famously, the late Justice Scalia um, was very pessimistic about uh, the ability of courts to draw lines between lawful delegations and, and unlawful, unconstitutional, overbroad delegations. And, uh, now we see Justice Thomas and, and new Justice Gorsuch have, have written about these in their judicial opinions, um, identifying the problem but without drawing clear lines. And it is one of those places where the, the first step really has to be for, for Congress to, uh, if I could borrow one of Kevin's favorite lines, Congress needs to make itself great again. Well, and, and that's, that's all I was asking. I think with guys like you that have looked at the subject matter, it would be very helpful if you began the uh, the model uh, language to restrain the administrative leviathan. Uh, it would be helpful, and, and uh, sunsets are easy, but some of the limitation so that Congress does have to make itself uh, relevant is um, you could at least give them the language and we would all know what the target was. Sure. But thank you, guys. Once again, if you'd like to join the conversation, push the star button, then the pound button on your telephone. We've got one question pending, then our lines are wide open. Let's take another call now. Adam, this is Lenore Ostrowski. Um, just as a note, your article, which uh, is called Reforming Administrative Law to Reflect Administrative Reality, 
has a broken link. Oh, <laughs> well, thank you. I'll be sure to let the editors know that. Okay. I mean, I'll let the, the publisher know it. Right. It's a broken link everywhere, right? In other words, there's no way to get to it. Um, oh, they just they just unveiled a new website in the last couple of days, and so um, I'll make sure they know to fix that. I'm very sorry, but thanks for bringing it to our attention. Sure. Um, do you have anything to say about um, the sort of limiting language, um, that requiring limiting language? If the problem is unclear or vague regulations, then one um, aspect of judicial review is perhaps um, noting that there is no limiting language and sending it back to the agencies to install that limiting language. I mean, that you know, it's required in constitutional cases. I don't see why it wouldn't be required when dealing with regulations. Well, just to make sure um, I understand correctly, you're saying that if an agency promulgates an, an open-ended regulation, uh, the courts, rather than deferring to an agency's uh, interpretation of that regulation, as they so often do, should send the agency back to the drawing board in the first place to write proper standards into the regulation in, in the first place? Yes. I mean, that's that's that, that that's I'd say Philip Hamburger, who wrote an influential book recently called "Is Administrative Law Unlawful?" Um, and believe me, the the title is the question of the title is rhetorical. Uh, he, he thinks it is unlawful. He argues that um, in terms of Congress, if Congress writes a law with no real substance in it, no real standards, then the court should declare the law to be no law at all, and 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 rather than allow the agent the, the agencies to fill content in. Um, I think your approach would be equivalent to that, to basically force the agencies to write content into their regulation and, and in the meantime, uh, not let, not allow the uh, the agencies or the courts to fill content in outside of the rulemaking process. And that would certainly be one way to uh, force the agencies to do a better job in the first instance. Yes. My chief beef with the agency, at least the Department of Education, is that it, it issues what it calls clarifications which are, of course, not clarifications. <laughs> they are, in fact, new guidance, and often guidance that isn't guidance at all. It is a regulation that simply hasn't declared itself as such. So um, the clarification, in other words, the clarification has become um, a way of attempting to evade any sort of supervision. We've got still two questions pending. Let's take another call here. Go ahead, caller. Yeah, hi. yeah, hi, and and thank you um, for your presentation. Uh, and hopefully not too self-indulgent a question, but I'm wondering if the commenters could uh, speculate or have some informed views. Um, Justice Scalia, uh, before he passed, was obviously heading toward a renewed degree of rigor in reviewing administrative agencies. Uh, Michigan v. EPA was the last uh, majority opinion he gave, and he also uh, voted to stay the clean power plan. I I'm wondering if you could comment um, on where you think Scalia was going or what sort of analytic foothold he was searching for uh, to be more you know, rigorously exacting of agencies than he had been, say, 20 years before on the court. Well, this is Adam. Let me take the first stab at that. I think you're right in your sense that Justice Scalia was on a trajectory towards rethinking some of his approach to administrative law. Um, there's hints of it in a couple of opinions. And, and around the time he passed away, both before he died and after, um, I had heard from, from people around Scalia who saw him speak at public events who said he was you know, affirmatively suggesting and saying that it was time to rethink some things. Um, Scalia was the court's most famous and um, uh, resilient defender of Chevron deference. He wrote an article on it in 1989, not long after he joined the court, um, in defense of Chevron deference. Uh, over time, uh, his colleagues, both on the left and the right, began to really water down the Chevron framework, depriving it of a lot of the stability and transparency that he thought was so important to the framework. Um, I, I don't think it's hard to, 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 
I don't think it's totally off base to suspect that he might have himself uh, had much more to say on Chevron if he had been able to stay on the court longer. Um, he already had walked back his view of deference to agencies' interpretations of their own regulations. Um, I think after that, if he did re begin to rethink or, or reform his views of Chevron, um, that would raise the next doctrine sort of logically attached to that would have been the non-delegation doctrine, which, like I said, he had always been very skeptical of the court's ability to police that the line of, of constitutional delegations versus non unconstitutional delegations of legislative power. Um, he had offered some views on it in the Whitman case and in the sentencing guideline case, Mistretta. Um, but I think if he had stayed on the court longer, we would have seen, uh, I, I think or I hope, we would have seen some interesting opinions from him um, on, on that subject as well. Any of our other experts want to weigh in on this? We've still got two questions pending. Uh, yes, Kevin. The one thing I would just add is, uh, and I am clearly inferior to Adam in my uh, familiarity with Scalia, despite, despite reading a lot of Scalia, I, I detected in Scalia's, uh, I guess, slow evolution on the administrative state that he also had an interest in the kind of larger constitutional balance question. Um, the administrative state is one of those things which can sound reasonable in concept, um, logical in many ways, but over time as you watch it grow in authority and power and that the you know, the power vis a vis the legislative branch, and you see the preponderance of cases that end up being kicked to the courts which involve uh, regulators taking things a bit too far and often with kind of a clear political motivation, it, it, it prompts the question of the um, well-being of the constitutional system. And Justice Scalia loved the constitutional system, and certainly he lamented uh, aspects of it where certain players often in Congress would, did not play their role as fully as they should. But I have to believe that that was kind of a concern that was with him and may have been propelling some of this evolution. Yeah, some of Justice Scalia's best writings on administration were actually the, the articles that he wrote before he was on the Supreme Court, even before he was on the D.C. Circuit, when he was um, – a professor and a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, he edited the the, the institute's in-house magazine, Regulation, and uh, and there he wrote a number of really great articles, including an article I highly recommend um, called "Regulatory Reform: The Game Has Changed." It was in the the January 1981 issue of Regulation magazine, so the issue keyed to Reagan's uh, inauguration, his first inauguration, and and in that article and others, Scalia really walked through the practical aspects of administration, and he really seemed to conceive of the administrative state as as a as a area of law where there's lots of room for play in the joints within broader constitutional uh, requirements. That, that there was room to get creative in thinking about how to allocate power to agencies, um, and and I, I wrote about this a little bit after his passing. Uh, for the blog of the Yale Journal on Regulation and for the Weekly Standards blog with lots of links to those articles. And I highly recommend you look uh, look Scalia's articles up. They're freely available now on, on Cato, the Cato Institute's website. Still two questions pending, so let's take another call. Hi, thank you so much for your thoughts. Um, I'm Wes Hungui, student member from Rice University. Um, uh, I actually attended a Federalist Society event at Yale where Justice Thomas also remarked on the administrative state, and that's what sparked my interest. Um, my question is, uh, what do you think about the viability and the implications of the appointments clause? Uh, should the president use the appoint appointments clause to uh, consolidate power and make the administrative state more accountable? Thank you very much. Yeah, this is Oren. I, I think that's a great question. And, you know, it's something that has come up in a few contexts early in, in the Trump administration here, um, you know, especially with respect to news stories about kind of political appointees or minders from the White House um, on the agency staffs. Um, you know, I've seen an argument that it's improper to have uh, White House personnel giving direction to uh, to agencies if they have not been 
if, if those individuals have not been um, Senate confirmed. Um, you know, that, that argument in particular, I think, is is pretty baseless. We obviously have had regulatory czars for a long time. Um, but more generally, I think the idea of, of political control over agency uh, rulemaking is very important. Uh, rulemaking is a form of legislating, and it should be under political control. Uh, where the rubber meets the road, of course, is is on how uh, how well the the administration is actually functioning, and in, in that respect, the the Trump administration and the uh, the the paranoias and habits of of a lot of the members have not spoken well for uh, for a lot of the things that they've tried to do. So I, I would say that the way it is being done at this moment in time uh, raises some concerns, but that in principle. Uh, that process of, of the White House uh, putting in place the people who are going to direct how rulemaking is done is, is appropriate. Very good. We've still got one question pending. I think we've got time here, 10 minutes or so. Let's take another call. Hi, this is Robert Barker calling from Atlanta. In the structure of scientific revolutions, Kuhn famously talked about how there were um, scientific revolutions when science was clearly leading to an improper result. And the most famous one was the example of the cycles and epicycles that used to define how the solar system was defined, being replaced by the solar-centric view. And haven't we reached a point in the administrative law where we just created cycles and epicycles to try to preserve the integrity of the Constitution with the administrative state, and it's not working anymore. It seems like, for example, in, in appeals of arbitral awards, um, the arbitrator can't define his own jurisdiction, and the arbitrator can't take an action or can't make a decision that would, for example, impose slavery on a person or do something that would be unconstitutional. And yet we have instances all the time where administrative courts are doing things that we think of as being unconstitutional, or administrative agencies are doing things that we think of as being unconstitutional. So shouldn't there be some sort of limiting factor? And are we at a point now where we just need to blow up the APA altogether and start over again? You know, I'm, this is Adam. I'm glad you raised that because as it happens, I've been thinking about that book a lot myself lately. Um, a couple of weeks ago, or I guess almost a month ago, I posted an essay at the Yale Journal on Regulations blog um, titled Structure of Regulatory Revolutions. And I tried to make the point that, that you just made very well, uh, that that the growth of the administrative state in some ways reflects the phenomenon that Thomas Kuhn wrote about uh, in terms of paradigms and paradigm shift. And, and one of the points I stressed that I took from Kuhn is that once a, a paradigm becomes settled and entrenched, the people that work in that field tend to focus disproportionately on on ever smaller issues, you know, filling in ever smaller gaps in the overarching framework. And so sometimes the people in the field are the least uh, the least well prepared to recognize that the framework itself is 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 failing, um, and that a, a new paradigm uh, is poised to replace it. I, I I see some of that. I think I like to think uh, when when outside critics like Philip Hamburger or uh, Justice Thomas um, or, or or politicians criticize administrative law, their criticism tends to be shrugged off by administrative law professors. And I think that might actually say more right now about the law professors than it does about the critics. Right. Um, and uh, and at the same time, I think that between the Gorsuch nomination and the, the rising criticism in Congress and out in the states um, and now uh, from Trump, I think it really ought to challenge administrative law professors and scholars of public administration more generally to take a step back from the ever narrower questions they're asking and start really grappling with first principles and and asking with clear eyes whether the administrative state as it currently exists serves proper uh, purposes, both in terms of constitutional principle and in terms of the actual outcomes from these agencies. I think that's right. Anybody, uh, any of our other experts want to weigh in on this point? Okay. Let me make a call for questions, a final call for questions. We've got about five minutes left. If you have a question, push the star button and the pound button on your telephone. We do have one more question. 
push the right button here and see if we can get to this final question. Go right ahead, caller. I think it's Frank Scatero calling with a, a question about uh, whether you'd have a, a practical proposal uh, on just dealing with um, uh, management in the civil service that doesn't perform, even if you're just talking about inefficiency, whether the whole paradigm of the civil service should be replaced with a modern management system, and then connected with that, should the Hatch Act be amended accordingly to uh, reduce some of that uh, barrier that exists between uh, political appointees and career civil service? Yeah, I'll, I'll say something about that. This is Oren. I, I think civil service reform should be a huge part of the uh, the overall puzzle here. You know, the one distinction I would make is that by and large, the, the kind of rank and file civil service tend to be more engaged on the kinds of day-to-day -day agency activities that I described, whether it's enforcement or data collection or, uh, you know, permitting, uh, whereas it tends to be uh, more high-ranking officials um, and appointees who are who who have the reins of the rulemaking, and so um, you know it seems to me that if if our goal is to get accountability into what the rules are, uh, we we need modern management um, from the White House into the agencies um, to the extent that we also need to get more accountability in the way civil service bureaucrats are carrying out their day to day functions. That's where I think, in particular, civil service reform becomes important. Thank you. Uh, yeah, this is Kevin chiming in. One one thing I have put out there, which um, has gone over like a lead uh, lead zeppelin, uh, but I'm going to keep stumping for it, is that government should think uh, or experiment, better yet, with hiring civil servants on, say, 10-year renewable contracts. Um, I think this would be good for both parties, quite frankly. I think that it, you know, as somebody who worked in government for over a decade, I think it's very easy as an employee when you realize that it's almost impossible to get fired after your first year of federal service, it's very easy to get lazy, maybe a little arrogant, um, it makes it very difficult for you to be managed. Um, and having this check-in time every 10 years, say, where the government can part company with somebody if they're a persistent problem, or an individual can just make, look at themselves and honestly say, you know what, my heart's not in this job anymore, I'm leaving. I think that would be valuable. But unfortunately, for the time being, we seem to still be locked into a system which is an either-or. Either the work is completely contracted out to the private sector, um, or it's done in-house by folks who pretty much have life tenure. Um, I, I think there's a third way and a better way. This is Adam. I just add that on, on civil service reform, um, the thing that might most effectively put wind in the sails of reform is is for the self-styled resistance movement inside of agencies to just keep doing what they're doing as loud as they're doing it. It's been sort of astonishing since Trump's inauguration to see people, especially at the EPA, but also at other agencies, um, not just criticizing President Trump and, and the heads of the agencies, but to suggest that that the agency has a mission uh, that's defined by the agency itself rather than by the Congress, the president, and the head of the agency. Agency. Um, some of the quotes in these articles in the New York Times and Politico are just astonishing that that agency personnel would sort of so boldly assert that they themselves are the ones in charge of an agency's agenda rather than Congress, uh, the president, and the head of the agency. And I think that if the self-styled resistance movement persists as vocally as it has for an extended period of time, that might actually help create some momentum for significant civil service reform um, in Congress, or one only hopes. Okay, we will let that be the final word then. Of course, we're speaking to the co-authors of Unleashing Opportunity. Once again, the name of the book, Unleashing Opportunity, Policy Reforms for an Accountable Administrative State, available online. Um, I want to thank uh, all three of our guests today for what has been an elucidating presentation. I want to thank the audience as well uh, for dialing in and for your, your thoughtful questions. A quick announcement about our next scheduled teleform conference call tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern Time.
we'll be talking about the Guam election that was purportedly to be open only to those who met the definition of native inhabitant of Guam. Uh, that's tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern time at this same number. But until that next call, we are adjourned. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed this practice group podcast. For materials related to this podcast and other Federal Society multimedia, please visit the Federal Society's website at fedsoc.org slash multimedia.